Thank you, Sebastian Maslow. <laughs> um, so th thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you coming on such short notice. Um, it's an unusual um, way uh, to start a, a presentation, but I'm very grateful to you and also to anybody watching on the internet. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, I'm going to keep it very short. Um, because obviously, you know, um, a small number of people and, and everybody has a lot of other things to do. Um, so, um, I normally work on international relations and foreign policy. Um, and actually, I've worked with Sebastian. We have a book on um, risk in security in, in East Asia. Um, but I'm also interested in public diplomacy and communication. Uh, so that is like strategic communication. Um, so, for example, in public diplomacy, you communicate with foreign publics to try to explain to them how correct and how righteous and how virtuous your country is and your foreign policy is. And that's actually quite similar to risk communications. That's how I got interested in this, because um, when you want to communicate risk, much like public diplomacy, you have to understand and consider very carefully the target audience. Um, you have to appear, create an image of openness, of honesty. You have to have a dialogue. Uh, you have to demonstrate that you're open to self-criticism and also criticism from others. And this creates credibility and it creates trust. And trust is very difficult to create. It's very difficult to win, but it's very easy to lose. Uh, and it's really important in strategic communication, whether it's public diplomacy or, in this case, risk communication. So this paper is actually about Japan's the government's response to Fukushima disaster, but specifically about the risk communication, not about the radiation and so on, not specifically about that. It's about science. It's about the uh, risk communication. And it's something I'm working with a couple of other people. And they're the experts on food safety. So my interest, as I said, is in the communication part. So that's the part that I know more about. I'm not so strong on the, um, the, uh, the food safety side. And as Sebastian said, it's a very interesting topic also for us. Um, because we were here uh, on the GCOE, is that what it's called? GCOE program? Global Centre of Excellence. Global Centre of Excellence program in 2011. Um, so both of us, like I'm sure many of you, had to decide what was considered safe, what was safe to eat, what wasn't safe to eat. Was the government telling the truth? Was the radiation, uh, was the radioactivity in food low enough that the food was okay? Um, and what sources of information could we trust? Um, and so that's, that's a key issue. Um, so what was interesting was that there was very low trust in food from Fukushima and more generally from Tohoku. Um, it was very hard to sell food from the region uh, for months and even years afterwards, and even at these very cheap prices. So uh, fruit from Fukushima and other prefectures, which was normally considered to be very, very high quality and very, very expensive, was sold off very, very cheap. And even in those, at those cheap prices, still people didn't buy them. So as uh, probably some other international students who were living in Japan, we normally couldn't afford to eat fancy Fukushima pears and peaches and so on. But in the period after the, the earthquake, we were actually able to eat all of these fruits because we decided, or some of us at least, that the food was safe, even if other people were saying that it wasn't safe. So I always wondered why did so many people avoid the food, even though it was the testing said that it was safe. So the the food system seemed to be working. It seemed that very little radioactive food was entering the food system, but yet people didn't trust the food. So one of the reasons, and there's a number of reasons, um, and I think that the, one of them is not the food safety system itself, which seemed to be more or less successful in keeping out radioactive food, but um, it was a failure of the risk communication system. So that is that the government's risk communication responses to the food safety risks intensified public confusion and uncertainty and contributed to the ongoing erosion of trust in food governance. Um, so I won't go into much detail because 
I'm speaking to an audience, obviously, of people who know all about the Fukushima disaster. Um, the key context is that for the weeks and months after the, the explosions of the plant, information on the scale and extent of radioactive, radioactive contamination was very scarce. And so was information on contamination of the food chain, which was obviously uh, problematic considering Tohoku is such an important agricultural area. So in the absence of clear information, the response by consumers was mass avoidance. So without good information, the de default response was to avoid eating the food. So the government had to reinstate the idea that the food was safe. That was the government's jobs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk about what risk communication is. I'm going to talk about how the government set the standards for radioactivity in food, which maybe some of you will remember. And then I'm going to talk about some programs the government had to try to make people think that the food was safe. Um, so, uh, what I'll try to, to conclude is that um, there's actually an irony. The, the added value of using this risk communication approach is that there's an irony in the state's response to the Fukushima food crisis, and that's that instead of focusing on the radiation and the radioactivity and the potential dangers or not dangers, uh, they actually focused on the public's uh, misinformation, on the public's incorrect understanding. Um, and in fact, it was the government that gave the public, created the confusion, and then it criticized the public for being confused and uh, for not having the correct information. So in a sense, the government response caused the avoidance. But hopefully, I'll come back to that later and hopefully it makes sense. Um, so risk communication, um, until the end of the 1990s, uh, and this is not only in risk communication, but also public relations and general strategic communication. The conventional approach to this communication was something called the information deficit model. So the problem is the public doesn't know, the public doesn't understand. We, the experts, and we, the government, we need to inform them. We need to tell them directly what the situation is. We decide what information they should get, and we convey the information to them. Um, there's no space for the opinions or perceptions of the people. That's irrelevant. So it's from one to the other. So the people's opinions are irrelevant. However, this has been shown to be a not a very effective. This is not very effective form. Uh, and so these days, it's much more common and it's kind of understood that you have this participatory turn. So you have to have a dialogue. You have to have interaction. Um, it's important for the institutions, the experts, the government, to seek to understand what the people are thinking. Why are they thinking what they're thinking? And then when you understand the target audience, then you adjust your risk management strategies in order to restore public confidence and trust. So the goal is to basically get the public uh, to arrive at a balanced judgment themselves. So you don't specifically say exactly what they have to do, but you get give them a good understanding so that they can make up their own minds, make an informed decision, an informed and balanced decision about the risks uh, based on their own interests and values. Um, and it's important that these, you know, this information that you're giving them is information which they can use. So it's no use giving them like technical details if they don't understand the technical details. So for example, if there's a typhoon coming and the government says there's a barometric pressure of 950 millibars and a surface area of seven degrees of latitude, that's not useful information. You can't make an informed decision about how you should behave, what precautions you should take if you get this information. Um, also with food ingredients, for example, in many countries, uh, instead of it saying how much salt there is, if I tell you there's 500 milligrams of salt in a product, that's not useful unless you know if that's a lot of salt or a little salt. So many countries will say that is a, this is 2% of your daily allowance or 5% of your daily allowance. So this is useful information that you can then take this information, you can think about it, you can make a decision, a risk decision yourself as to whether you want to consume the product, as to whether you should go outside in the typhoon, and so on. So that's the role of the government, is to provide clear, simple information based on an understanding of the target public. Um, the Japanese government has formally declared since 2004 that this is the kind of risk communication it endorses. So this is, has been implemented 
in through in the various different levels of the, bureauc of the bureaucracy. However, as we'll see, this actually, in the, in the case of Japan, it has said that it implements it, and it looks like it's implementing it, but in reality what it's doing is the traditional uh, one-way communication. So, um, before I go on, I just want to introduce two small concepts that are important uh, to think about. One is this thing of manufactured versus reasonable uncertainty, and this is where it becomes difficult to say exactly how much uncertainty should we consider to be okay and what kind of uncertainty should we be considered to be uh, dangerous. So, for example, um, we would say with climate change, the scientific evidence says climate change is a real thing. Therefore, people who deny climate change, this is manufactured uncertainty or unreasonable uncertainty. We shouldn't allow this. We don't have to listen to people who say that climate change doesn't exist or people who say that smoking doesn't cause health problems. This is incorrect information. So we don't need to have this long dialogue uh, and we don't need to... to, to um, it just needs to be corrected or... Uh, so smoking, climate change, um, vaccination problems. And it's difficult for the government, for our government to decide how to deal when it thinks that it's manufactured uncertainty. And one of the things that happened in the case of Japan is that the government decided that this uncertainty about the safety of food was unreasonable. So it should not be tolerated. It should not be spoken about. We don't need to listen to these people who think that there should be some kind of... Um, some kind of uh, uncertainty. Anyway, and the final point I want to make is on trust. Um, so trust, like I said, uh, is, is very, very difficult to generate, but it's very important and it's very easy to lose. Um, and trust is necessary for risk communication. If you don't have trust, your risk communication will be a failure. So you, if the institution is not trusted, if it's trying to communicate, people won't listen, it won't matter anyway. Um, so people really rely on the credibility and the sincerity of the institutions that they're dealing with. Um, and actually, successful risk communication and trust, they are uh, like dialectic. So good risk communication builds trust, and having trust helps good risk communication. So they work very, very well together. And like I said earlier about like public diplomacy, uh, credibility and trust comes from things like showing self-awareness, being open to criticism, engaging in dialogue, being competent, so being fulfilling the job correctly. Uh, and all of these increase, increase credibility and trust. Um, however, the smallest little mistake by an agency or by an institution can destroy trust. So it's very, very easy to lose, and that's really, really important. And uh, in the case of Japan... There had been a number of issues previously from the BSE in the early 2000s, um, uh, well, a number of food uh, safety issues. So there was some already some skepticism, some lack of trust in, in the food safety system. Um, also, the response of TEPCO and the government to the initial Fukushima crisis created, as we all remember, uh, an atmosphere of skepticism and distrust because we didn't know what who was saying what. There was contradictory information. There was fighting between the different agencies. There was th uh, blaming uh, at different agencies. So this clearly impacted the public's response to the risk communication. So if you couldn't trust the government to tell you the truth about the Fukushima disaster, how could you trust the government to tell you the truth about food safety and radioactivity in food? So the trust was was lacking. Um. Okay, let's, how are we doing for time? Oh, not too bad. Um, so, as I said, I, I don't need to go into the Fukushima disaster because I think everybody knows more than enough about it already. Um, within a week, though, media reports were talking about uh, high levels of radioactivity in food, um, and prefectural governments were issuing bans, so prohibiting the shipment of different kinds of food, for example, milk and spinach. Um, meanwhile, the then chief cabinet secretary, so Kambo Chokan, that's the one, Edano um, Yukio, was issuing statements that uh, the consumption of food would not cause an immediate health risk. So he was saying the food is safe. 
even if it's got some radioactivity, it's safe. Um, and despite this, um, there was no clear measure of what was safe. He was saying it was all safe, but what amount was safe? This was not clear. Um, so there was a lot of different information coming from prefectural governments, from different government agencies, from politicians, uh, and there was an urgent need for the government to actually say how much radioactivity is safe and what clearly define what safe food is so that people can understand and people can, can understand what is an acceptable risk. So um, they issued these provisional regulatory values, PRVs, uh, very, very quickly. And these PRVs um, were provisional insofar as they were how much radiation can you is okay in water or how much radiation is okay in beef and so on. But the problem was that these PRVs were changed already. They were implemented, but then suddenly they were changed a number of times up and down. Uh, also, they didn't cover all foods. So if a PRV was not for a certain foodstuff, there was still no clarity on what, whether, how much radiation could be allowed in this food. So, um, so this created an atmosphere further of mistrust because they were changing the standards uh, and the standards were not uh, universal. Uh, meanwhile, many different companies and individuals were setting up citizen and, and consumer uh, radiation monitoring. So Aon, for example, uh, was providing uh, higher, more strict testing of the food that it was selling. So you knew that if you went to Aon, it was even stricter and safer than what the government said was. So this undermined the government's standards. Um, then the Food Safety Commission uh, did a, a test, uh, did a, a risk assessment of these PRVs and said that it didn't think that they were uh, adequate. So this again, the Food Safety Commission is part of the government, so one element of the government was undermining what another part of the government was, was doing. Um, so I'll skip on a little bit. Um, Oh, so another, well, I'll give it two or three other problems with the PRVs was it only focused on things like cesium, but it didn't include other radioactive materials. It didn't include fish, uh, and the, it was less strict than what had been used in Belarus and in Ukraine after Chernobyl. Uh, and then you had also um, politicians contributing to the confusion. Um, so in Tokyo, initially the consumption of tap water was restricted, um, especially for younger people and infants. And then they distributed in March, late March bottled water to everybody. And then the next day after the bottled water was distributed, Ishihara came out on television drinking the water and telling everybody that it's always delicious or always tastes good. Um, and then the next day, there was another morning saying, don't drink the water. So, especially children. So, um, again, you had very contradictory messages from all the different parts of, of government, uh, which contributed to the erosion of trust in what the government was saying. Um, and then you had all these set pieces like this. Um, so this was President Li Meng Bak and Hu Jintao from China and Khan eating Fukushima food, which is probably not Fukushima food, to be honest. But um, this kind of set piece didn't make people think that it didn't reassure people it looked slightly ridiculous from the outside. Um, so this was not effective risk communication, I suppose you would say. Um, so they inter uh, I'll very briefly get through this, but just to say that after some months, there was a report issued with new standards. So Ministry of Health introduced new standards. And um, they invited public comments in the process of the, the new report, which is what you do in dialogic, so the participatory risk communication, the modern form of risk communication, they did invite public comments. So it looked like this kind of new kind of risk communication, but in fact, it was very, very poor risk communication because the focus of the report was one number, 100 microsieverts, which is how much radiation one person can have over one lifetime. Um, and this was the number that came out from the report. But this didn't make clear sense to the public because most people don't know what 100 microsieverts over one lifetime means. I didn't also know what 100 microsieverts over one lifetime means. Uh, and it wasn't clearly explained. It, you were given this number, but it wasn't clear what you were supposed to do with this number. What actions should you do to reduce your risks? 
Um, it's like I said with the, the typhoon information or the, the salt or the fat in foods. If you get abstract scientific data, uh, you need to be given uh, clear explanations of what this data is and how you can make decisions based on this information. Um, so then the government introduced, based on this 100 microsieverts, a new uh, standards. And I don't know if you remember this, but the, the standards were much, much, much stricter. Um, 20 times more strict than the previous standards for something like water, five times more strict f by general foods. So it was very, very strict. And then the farmers and other uh, consumer or selling uh, producer bodies were criticizing it um, because they said they were too strict. They weren't scientific. Uh, so the, even the Ministry for Agriculture came out and criticized the standards. Um, the other part that was strange about the standards was that they were announced in October. Uh, but they would come into effect in April 2012. So the announced in October 2012 come into effect in April 2012. So that meant that food which would be considered safe by the government in October, November, December, January and February would no longer be safe to eat in April. So it was very confusing. If the safe food is safe to eat and I'm not causing damage to myself today or next week or next month, how can it suddenly be dangerous to eat this food in April? This is a confusing message. Uh, and this also contributes again to the erosion of trust. Why would it be safe now and not safe in a few months? So overall, anyway, the general response was inconsistent. It was confusing. confusing. It created distrust. It created uncertainty. Uh, and it made it difficult for people to know what exactly they should do in order to protect themselves and protect their family. So as a result, there was large scale avoidance of food from Tohoku. Uh, and perhaps because I didn't speak very good Japanese, I didn't know all of this was going on. So I was happy to keep eating the food. <laughs> and maybe if I had known of all this crazy confusion and the contradictory statements from the government, maybe I wouldn't have eaten the, the, the fruit. I don't know. Anyway, um, so Briefly, um, because we're going to try and bring it to a quick close, uh, there was the government's response. Um, and there's two little cases in the paper. One is this case, uh, conversations about radiation and food, which I'm going to butcher my bad pronunciation is Tabemono Tohoshase Bushitsu no Hanashi. And this was like a program from 2012 on, and as you can see, the word conversation, so it sounds like the government is going to talk and going to listen to what the people have to say so that it can understand them, so it's good risk communication. Um, but that was not the, the actual case. The, it appeared to be conversations and it appeared to be a dialogue, but in fact it was just the government sent literature, so pamphlets and leaflets, um, about radiation, but they and it sent them to libraries, to city halls, to supermarkets, Maybe, I don't know, it was a few years ago, maybe you saw them in the supermarkets, but it was little information that you could pick up in hospitals and uh, everything all over Japan. Um, but they weren't actually about radiation. So um, instead of talking about radiation, the first one that was sent out, for example, said uh, nothing about food, but we face radiation every day in x-rays, from space, you know, um, be just existing on earth you're getting radiation. So instead of telling us about the food, it was normalizing radiation to make us feel that we shouldn't be worried about that radiation. The second leaflet focused on smoking and obesity and said that these were much more dangerous. Being fat or smoking was much more dangerous than radiation. Um, and it didn't really talk about Fukushima anyway. And it said that what you should do is live a healthy lifestyle. Even though it's in the conversations about radiation, it's telling you that you should be active and healthy and not so. And the final leaflet was focusing on agriculture and showing all the farmers and saying how difficult life was for those farmers and that they're going to go out of business because people are not eating the food. Um, so even though it said conversations about radiation, there was no reference to radiation in food or to the government standards that I mentioned or to the science that was used for the government standards. Actually, there was no real science involved in the, the thing at all. Uh, and th so it was all about creating some kind of ancient idea. But anyway, I'll skip, skip forward a little bit. Um, 
this was another program that was quite similar to the previous one insofar as it was uh, pretending to be two-way dialogue but was actually just one-way transmission of information. It was called Radiation Risk Communicators. It was supposed to be teaching the consumers to manage and communicate risk themselves. So that was that people, that was done in every prefecture, um, people would go and have a training program. It was open to everybody, but it was especially for nurses, uh, cafeteria staff, school cafeteria staff, and, and so on, people dealing with 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 health and with food. Uh, and they would have um, three days where they would be taught about radiation and food risks. And then they are told to go out into society and then explain this information to society. So they become the communicators. Um, but much like the other uh, thing I was telling you about, um, it wasn't really about learning about radiation in food and learning about the the science. It was actually about the fuhyo higai, the harmful rumors, and about how people should eat food from tohoku. So again, it was a lot of information about the farmers. Uh, it was information about how, um, let's see, uh, the damage caused by harmful rumors. Uh, the only information about food safety was that the food is safe. So we need to stop talking about that now. That was basically the, the idea in the program. Uh, we felt like if you look at the literature. So it was really, it, the, it's supposed to be about exchanging opinions and information, but in fact there's really only one opinion, and that's the food is safe, and the rumors are harmful, and the people need to eat talk of food. Um, so it, there is no actual exchange. Uh, uh, so again, in, in the... In this program, the participants were told that the public is unnecessarily harming the producers who are victims uh, of already the victims of the disaster and now the victims of the people. So they're victims of the public who are not consuming their food. Uh, so people need to uh, stop the harmful rumors. They need The communicators on the program need to make sure that the rest of the public gets the correct information. So that the seikakuna joho and that they need everyone needs to eat and support the people from Toho, the Toho performers. Um, so, to sum up, um, the consumers are responsible for staying correctly informed and countering the, the harmful rumors. The danger is not radiation. Radiation is under control. The danger is public uncertainty and the lack of correct knowledge. That's the danger. And that's the real risk, not the radiation risk. Um, and those participants have a special responsibility uh, now to go out into, into Japan and, and communicate with other people and give them the correct information. Um, so, um, to conclude, uh, or provisionally conclude, um, if we just consider risk communication, like I was saying at the beginning of Risk, what's good risk communication, what's bad risk communication. And I mean, to be fair to the government, there was a trust deficit from the beginning because of the poor handling of the overall uh, Fukushima disaster. So even before the food crisis began, uh, the arguments between TEPCO and between the government, the lack of information and so on had already created a lack of trust before there was issues with food safety. Um, but the initial response to the food safety issues increased this uncertainty because it provided contradictory information. It provided information that was not based in any kind of science. Um, so it appeared arbitrary. Um, like I said, for example, why delay the implement standards in April in October? So what logic does it make to say that food is safe now, but in five months it's actually dangerous, so you can't eat it, but it's okay to eat it now. So there was a clear lack of logic, uh, and this caused um, a lot of problem. And I said before, it's important to be self-aware, to be open to criticism, and to, um, to self-criticize, because this makes you credible. Um, but instead, the government was not self-aware. The government avoided or... Uh, certainly didn't criticize itself, but also rejected any criticism of it. Um, basically, the government was telling people what to think without taking into account their concerns. 
Um, and maybe if the government had said, well, we made some mistakes and we've learned from those mistakes uh, and now we're, and explained clearly that it was doing what it was doing, why, based on experience, maybe this would have got it more credibility uh, and thus maybe more trust. Um, but they contradicted the fundamental principle of modern risk communication uh, by focusing on the concerns of the public, yes, but not in a learning way, but in a critical way, so criticizing the public's concerns as uninformed and as dangerous. So in a sense, there, there was a great irony, like I said at the beginning, hopefully now it makes sense, the main focus of risk communication wasn't on the dangers of radiation, but it was on the dangers of the public and the public's response uh, and the public's uncertainty. And it was the government who had created the public uncertainty to begin with. So it was criticizing the public for being uncertain, but the government had made the public uncertain. Uh, so yes, so we'll finish there. I think we're good for time. So yeah. So thank you very much. I think if you give him the applause. Oh, thank you. Not very loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh,